Welcome to the I Believe Podcast, an Acure Insight production, brought to you by Castle Biosciences. I'm your host, Danae Peterson, a fellow ocular melanoma survivor. Here on the podcast, we'll be sharing information and insights on treatments, research, and living with ocular melanoma. Castle Biosciences is a proud sponsor of this I Believe podcast. Castle Biosciences tests are designed to provide clinicians precise and personalized tumor information for the benefit of patient care. If you would like more information about how Castle is transforming the treatment of eye cancer, visit castletestinfo.com. Hi, you guys. Welcome back to the I Believe podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Danae Peterson, and I'm actually joined here by Kathy Ducey here in Florida. And she was diagnosed with ocular melanoma in February of 2016. And we were fortunate enough to connect with her after I think her second cookbook came out. Um, And we saw some articles and somebody had shared it and we were like, wait, we should reach out to Kathy. And then she responded and we were like, okay, well, we're going to talk to Kathy. Um, So Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your, just your family life. What do you, you and your husband do for work? Uh, I know that's part of the reason we found out about you is because of your husband's line of work. My husband is Steve Ducey. He's, uh, one of the hosts of Fox and friends from six to nine Eastern on the Fox news channel. And, uh, my son is Peter Ducey and he's a white house correspondent who is, uh, much to his mother's chagrin, um, President Biden, who he has a great relationship with, called him a stupid son of a bitch. So now (laughs) he's that guy. And uh, I have a daughter, Mary, who's a lawyer and uh, married. And our little one, Sally, is uh, married. She lives in Dallas and she's having a baby in the next month or so. And my son and his wife are expecting uh, this month. So we're about to be really busy. That's so exciting. Congratulations on becoming Thank grandparents you. like two times over in one year. That's in, that's insane. Very You're definitely, exciting. definitely going to be busy. Yes. Um, well, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what was, what was happening in your life at the time of your diagnosis in February, 2016? Well, we, uh, my husband still works, uh, in New York. We ha- the kids grew up and we lived in a house in New Jersey for like 25 years. So, uh, in looking down the road at retirement, we, uh, renovated a house in Florida and, um, I, in getting ready to come down to Florida, I, uh, wanted to get some sunglasses and prescription, uh, glasses. And so my husband said, you know, I need some for Florida too. So we went to our local doctor, uh, eye doctor, in our town, Dr. Clancy. And he said, you know, you have a freckle that wasn't there before. Uh, He didn't think it was anything to worry about at the time. He said, come back in a month. And when I went back, it had changed colors to the melanoma orange and sent me right away to um, Will's. And I saw Carol Shields and as anyone who's been through this after a full day of testing, um, I went the next day and, um, first the doctor said to go that day. And I said, well, it's snowing. There's a blizzard. Can I wait till tomorrow? And he said, yes. So got me an appointment with Dr. Wills at 7am and had all the testing. And then at the end of the testing, Dr. Shields came in and said, you have an ocular melanoma, and I'm going to save your life. And I, she's, she's always. I mean, I I haven't actually had Doctor Shields as my doctor, but I have heard that she is. Um, I don't know. She's so she's just so sweet. Um, but it just cracks me up some of the ways that she breaks the news to people. It's always different. And I looked surprised, and she said, "What did you think?" And I said, "I thought it was a freckle." Like I just didn't think that because I had no symptoms. I went to get sunglasses, but she's a powerhouse and um, she's the kind of person who you just follow whatever she said. And um, I think my melanoma was right around, is it two centimeters? 
the uh, probably two millimeters. Two millimeters, and uh, it was right at the point where um, they weren't lasering as much then. But um, she said the she fitted me for the plaque and said that that was really my only choice. Yeah, and the with the thickness, um, that that still tracks. I think even with laser, it's it's usually something under the two millimeter mark that is considered ideal for laser in some circumstances. Um, and I think that is an episode that is an episode that we have on the the podcast with Dr. Tim Murray, who's actually in Florida. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, um, but he's another ocular oncologist similar to Dr. Shields, but he focuses a lot on laser for smaller tumors. Um, but anyway, so. So you ended up being fitted for the plaque, um, and did you, I mean, did, did she give you other options, or was that kind of the only option that was given? The, that was the only option she had for me, and, uh, you know, knowing that she's one of the best people in the world, uh, you know, the worst thing anybody can do is uh, go on the internet before we go to bed (laughs) don't google and don't google right before bed this is like no we always hear this and we hear patients say it over and over again and yet we still do it i know and it keeps you up all night i uh, i went with what she said and uh just because i know she's the best in the world and uh i just i felt very confident with her and her team and her husband Dr. Jerry Shields was working then too, and he was involved in my care as well. And he's a very, very gentle, sweet man. And everybody, so I had the surgery at Wills and uh, just an incredible place. Yeah, it is. It's pretty incredible. I haven't actually gone to Will's Hospital, but I've walked past it. And um, it's massive in Philadelphia. But it is. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible what they do there for sure. And what a gift like that you were able to be, um, treated by both of them and just to, to yes. have, you know, connection with both of them. Cause I know Dr. Shields, the husband, Jerry, um, he does not practice nearly as much. So, uh, if at all, I think his wife has taken over most of the practice now. Um, so you were probably one of his last patients. <laughs> um, I'm, I might've been, he's there. Um, I go back for my checkup care once or twice a year and, uh, he's there um kind of soothing the kids and that are there and um talking to everybody and making everybody feel a little more comfortable well that's always a good person to have on the team for sure yes um, and, and and an incredible these the residents that are there uh are from all over the world so dr shields and the people at wills teach these kids their methods and they take it around the world yeah it's amazing what they can do and how they have branched out and just been able to help so many people like you said around the world yes um so despite dr jerry shields and his uh kind of i guess assistance and kind of presence during your diagnosis period and figuring out your treatment what was your initial you know initial reaction when you figured out like oh like i have i have eye cancer like what happened um how did you cope with that emotionally and mentally at first well, I was shocked because if you think someone has cancer, or especially eye cancer, uh, you would have symptoms or some symptom. I had none. None. And so it took a while to wrap my head around it, but I knew that I had to have the radiation. And uh, I knew that, you know, they sewed my eyes shut for five days and at wills they have uh the people that are that have the patch stay at a holiday inn and uh everybody's on the same floor and my kids came from college and uh their jobs to um be with me for the whole time and it was the while I was laying with my eye sewn shut at the holiday inn um, they, I had the idea cause I wasn't sure if it had been metastasized and what my future would be. So I thought, okay, when I get home, what do I have to do to get everything in order? And all I could think about was with my kids there and in the room, they had to stay 10 feet away because of the radiation. All I could think of was I've got to go home and write my recipes down 
so that everyone will have everything. I had a like a three ring binder and all kinds of recipes in there and things that I would take from a magazine, but I didn't have the ingredients and switch it. And um, the foods that made my kids happy. And I talked to my husband about it and I said, you know, we, you have a lot of famous friends and different people. We could uh, do a book, a cookbook of happy recipes. And that's how the idea came about. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. And, and I find, I find it interesting. I, I find the patients that I've talked to over the last two years, almost of doing this podcast, the patients who seem to cope the best emotionally and mentally are the ones who kind of grasp at straws, I think sometimes, and they find some purpose in all of this. They find something to focus on and then they just focus on it really, really heavily, whether it's just living really presently with their family or like what you did where you realize like, oh my goodness, I need, I need to like immortalize my recipes. I need to make these last. Um, and I feel like that, that kind of purpose, that drive that gives you something to focus on other than all of the uncertainty, all of the scary things, all of the what's going on, what's going to change, what's, what's life going to look like in five, 10 years. Um, so I, I just applaud you for, for that kind of perspective and, and getting there so quickly, like in the middle of your treatment. Thank you. Well, it was, um, as anyone who's been through it, it was very uncomfortable. Yeah, and for sure. Very, um, it was, it's a, it's a hard thing. But when I, after the surgery, I kind of thought, well, I had the cancer, the cancer's out. I still have the tumor, but, uh, the can my cancer, thank God has not come back. But I still have the tumor, and now I have issues with my retina from mm. the radiation, and I'm being treated for that. So it's not like, you know, I broke my kneecap years ago. I got knocked over by our golden retriever. Oh, and it's, no. not, <laughs> it's not like you can put your knee up and put ice on it. With your eye, uh, you can't forget that you have an issue. No, it's, that's, that's such a good point. And we, we talk about this a lot in the patient community that just among patients is this idea that like, okay, you know, you have, I don't know, you have a, a tumor in your, your skin, or maybe you, you're left with a scar from skin melanoma or just other kinds of cancers or different ailments and injuries that you can deal with physically. But your eye is something you literally open your eyes every day and you, and you see a difference, whether it's because you're blind and you've lost an eye or because your vision is failing over time because of radiation. Like there's just so many things that happen that we just, I think we, we don't realize how much our vision affects our everyday life until our vision is challenged on some level. Um, so over time, I mean, your diagnosis was 2016 and we're now in 2023 almost. So you're coming up on what does that make it? Seven years? Yes. Okay. So you're coming up on seven years. So over the past seven years, um, what has life looked like as far as your eye appointments, medical appointments? Um, do you see an oncologist and just any of those kinds of things? I still go back to Will's and, uh, with the pandemic, uh, it's been, I went back, uh, I'm due to go back and I've saw a doctor, the, is it Carrera at, um, the uh their eye cancer specialist at mm. uh, Bascom Palmer. Oh yeah, that does that sounds familiar. Um and, and I can't remember how to pronounce their name, but I think you're close. I think it's Carrera or Carrera or something. Yes, a Carrera maybe. Uh, and she was great um at Bascom Palmer in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. But I think she only comes up to this area once a month, so she had a lot of people and I realized, do all these people have eye cancer? And then I realized most of them, because from talking to people in the lobby, were coming from all over with a freckle. And doctor, the doctor there was ruling out the melanoma. So it, it was, it's, it's interesting to see everybody's, hear everyone's story. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's, and it's very interesting, uh, how, I mean, you know, we can have a freckle or a mole on our skin and it's the same with our eye. There's, there's so many people who have those freckles and those moles, so to speak on their eye that they never amount to anything. And so that, you know, that's, you know, great for those people, but it's like, okay, well, we lucked out our six in a million chance of having this ocular melanoma diagnosis. Yes. Um, 
So can you talk to us a little bit about like, what are some ways that, um, that your life has been challenged, like due to vision changes or just like traveling, like any of the ways that you feel like you've been challenged because of this diagnosis and how have you dealt with those challenges? Well, good question. I, uh, I, my depth perception is about four feet off and the other eye does take over, but, um, like it's very hard to see stairs. And so at home we have in New Jersey, we have a two story house and, uh, my husband put painter's tape on the stairs so I can differentiate the stair. And here we just have a two steps down to, um, the dining room and to go outside. So we've got the painter's tape there. And um, so I I try to do kind of workarounds. And I've got uh, the Volvo with the basically eyesight that keeps you in the lane. And I'm a super, super careful driver. And um, so I just, when there is a challenge, I try to do a workaround. And I every time I get out of the car, even with the camera, I'm four feet off. It looks like I'm all the way to those parking spot, but I'm four feet off and I park far away from everybody. So, um, just got to get your steps in. It's fine. Yeah. (laughs) True. True. (laughs) Um, well, I think that's great. Like just finding those kinds of workarounds and, um, cause I think, I think if we let those kinds of challenges, whether it's depth perception or, um, you know, the emotional side of things, whatever the challenge is, if we, as a, you know, as individuals allow, allow cancer more space than it deserves. And we, you know, kind of are, are unable to see the possibilities. Then I feel like it can be so much harder to deal with. And not to say that having challenges isn't still hard, but looking for the ways that you can solve it instead of, I guess, kind of woefully sitting with all of the hard is, I feel like so much more productive and, and feels a lot better as a person. You know, I tried to explain to my husband over Christmas, I said, you know, you can't see what you can't see. You you don't know what you don't know. Like, I, I'm afraid that there's a step that I'm not going to see or something that's coming at me on my cancer eye side. Um, it, and and it, it's a hard thing to explain to someone that doesn't have that issue. But um, I'm just super careful with everything. Well, I think that's, that's obviously very wise. I I know that I have definitely become more careful in certain things. And I'm definitely like you said, like you said, a lot more paranoid about like what's coming up on my blind side, like, or, you know, my, I, I have always been blind, but a lot of people have some level of vision loss and still have some vision. So I guess let's clarify that. Do you have vision? Still? I do. I do. Okay. The vision in my other eyes is very good. That's good. Or good. Um, and I do have the vision is varying. I, I've for the last two years, I've gotten um, Avastin and is it Arlia, mm-hmm. the other shot, and I haven't had a great um, response. And I've had laser treatments, uh, and I had a, the implant put in last month, and it turned out I was allergic to the steroid. Oh, no. I had to work. Do a work around that with us, lots of drops. And so it, it has not been easy. No, for sure. No, it's, it's definitely, I mean, whether you have radiation treatment for a small tumor and you have 10 years plus or the rest of your life dealing with moderate to severe vision or, you know, radiation retinopathy or a nucleation and you lose your eye and you have to deal with kind of the challenges of that. Like there's always something that you're dealing with. And like you said, it's something you, you can never really forget that you're dealing with it. One thing that, uh, like if you have other cancers, I guess that are more common and everybody's different, but when I ask the doctors what the prognosis is really for the future, they, uh, to say, you know, we're going to take it month to month. You still have your eye and you're alive. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's like, well, that's not an answer. That's like a non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but I am, I know I'm lucky to be alive and I know that I'm lucky to have the vision that I do. So I have to just be thankful for that. 
Well, and really, I mean, really lucky that, that it was found when it was so small too, because, um, we know now from just a lot of the research that's come out at like ISOO, which is a, an ocular oncology, um, kind of symposium or seminar that they're, that they host, I think every two to four years. Um, and Dr. Shields was actually at that, that seminar this last summer. But, um, we know that tumors that are found smaller tend to have a far better prognosis, whether, whether they're a high risk or a low risk in the biopsy process. Um, but it's just that, that idea of like early detection, but, but how would you have ever known? Because like you said, you never had symptoms and you never would have gone in unless you were moving to Florida and needed sunglasses. Like, and so it's just, it's so, it's so serendipitous. I think sometimes how it works out that someone can, can have their tumor found so early kind of just by accident. Yes. Um, and I, worry, and I, I wish that that happened more for people. I, I worry about people that don't need glasses and that don't get their eyes checked. Uh, because one of the things, um, with the book is that we've tried to raise awareness when, uh, We've done the TV promotion, so we've got three books now, and they do different segments on um, and run a few times uh, my cancer story and how I got the idea for the book, and we just encourage people to get their eyes checked. And through the years, people have reached out um, mainly to my husband to say, you know, I I ended up with a melanoma or if they're recently diagnosed, they reach out about what to do. And, but I worry about people that don't need to need glasses and don't get their eyes checked. Well, and that's all too common. Um, and I think that, you know, those people, those people are most likely to be affected if they hear somebody's story like yours or like mine, or if they have someone in their immediate life, like, like my husband had LASIK. And so until I got diagnosed, he hadn't had an eye, an eye exam in years. And, and he, you know, thankfully went in eventually like after my diagnosis and, and goes regularly now. But that's one of the things that at Acure Insight that we are really passionate as patients about is making sure that we, that we tell everyone, it doesn't matter if you need glasses or not, you need to have your eyes checked the same as you get your skin checked every year, or you have a well visit for your, you know, well women's or well men's visit. Like you need to make your eye health part of your regular care so that if there is something it's caught as early as possible, not because, not because everyone is going to have a chance of getting this, but there's, you know, there's also so many other different illnesses that can be determined through the eyes. Like there's a lot of things that can be found. The glaucoma can indicate, um, you know, pre, pre diabetes, I believe. And then there's, um, there's just things that can be seen that are going on like strokes or, you know, anything else that's going on health wise. that's not related to ocular melanoma. There's a lot of things that can be diagnosed using the eyes. Um, and, but generally it's, it's never a bad thing to have your eyes checked regularly. So that's one of the things that we're trying to change the the narrative around. And we're grateful, like definitely grateful for, for you and for your husband, for putting that out there in the world, um, and talking about that as regularly as you can. Um, and hopefully we can help support you guys in supporting people now that, you know, now that we've connected going forward. Yes. And I, uh, would like to help you and, uh, Melody in any way I can as well. Well, we're so grateful that you have been here, just willing to talk to us on the, on the podcast, um, and just to share your story and we'll, we'll get this out. We'll make sure that you guys can, can share this across your news platforms and just let everyone know that you did a podcast (laughs) episode and, and it was amazing. My first Um, podcast. I know you're so, you're so fancy. I know you have three, you said three cookbooks now. Yes. That's amazing. Okay. So tell us a little bit about how, how can people find your cookbooks? Uh, well, it was, uh, I think the number one cookbook, one of the top cookbooks of the year this year, and, um, it's on Amazon and, uh, it was number one around Christmas time on Amazon of all books. And it's still on the New York Times bestseller. So it's the happy cookbook on, um, and this is happy in a hurry and, uh, simply happy, happy in a hurry and the happy cookbook. I love it. Simply happy, happy in a hurry and the happy cookbook. Yes. And I'm going to grab those. I'll grab those links and I'll put those in our show notes so that, um, anyone who listens can go and snag one of those if they would like, Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's so fun. And I love how you kind of have evolved the the title, like simply happy, happy in a hurry, which I'm assuming <laughs> those are for the people like me who just need something quick and easy for my family. Yes, they're very um, easy recipes. Um, 
and especially with the last one, the Simply Happy Cookbook, the um, we made sure that uh, all the ingredients were available at Walmart. Oh, I love that. That's so cool that you were able to vet that and just figure figure that out um, just to make it as accessible to people as possible to yes. cook and to follow the recipes. And, and, and I know easy. you mentioned, <laughs> yes, you mentioned at the beginning, though, that part of the way that the recipes that you had in this three, being, three ring binder had evolved was because you had um, cut magazine cuttings out or like cut off, you know, a piece of something and then changed the recipe because you didn't have ingredient A, B, and C and you had to change it to whatever you had in the kitchen. Um, that's how I cook. So like I relate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. And now my kids all, uh, like to cook. And, uh, I think over the pandemic, people realized that they had to come up with things. There's a chicken pozole in there. That's for your crock pot that I guess you could make it on the stove too, but it was just things in your pantry, like yeah. easy things and, uh, easy recipes for people. I love that. Well, I hope that our readers will be able to take note and check out the cookbook Thank because you. I'm sure that would be really fun for some people. Um, and, and honestly cooking creativity, like using those kinds of skills or developing those skills, I feel like is also something that can help in the midst of something like this diagnosis where again, it just gives you something different to focus on instead of dwelling on how scared you are, you focus on, I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to try something new. Um, so I think that can be a really powerful tool for people. I hope so. So can you talk to us a little bit just briefly um, about how are your, um, like, do you have monitoring scans where you have an ultrasound of your liver or MRIs with Dr. Dr. Shields or a local oncologist? And, and how does that, how does that look for you now versus at the initial time of diagnosis? I, uh, I did the gene testing and I'm at a low risk for metastasizing. I didn't know that until after the surgery. Uh, but I've had two MRIs, the, the liver scans. I'm due for another. Um, I'm delayed because of the pandemic, but and I have a prescription. But uh, the doctor that I saw at uh, Baskin Palmer, and it took me almost, it took months to get an appointment with her, um, said that I should be in the clear since it's been over five years. So I may do it anyway, but... Um, yeah, well, and it, and it can't hurt also just to, to look, you know, look at the scans and look at the data or look, you know, do some research yourself to, yes. to learn about, you know, why are scans still important, even if you are low risk and how frequent should you still have them after the five-year mark? Because I know, at least from, from my understanding, that I know plenty of people who are lower risk but still have a scan once a year because their um, their doctor wants to be on the safe side and but they have you know maybe a different type of scan instead of an MRI maybe they just do a liver ultrasound after a certain point. Yeah. Um, there's kind of like lessening the intensity I think over time. I, I think that you know it's interesting because the different doctors that I've talked to uh, have said different things. So I, I guess it's up to me, but and I should do it. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and, you know, maybe not that you should necessarily for sure have the scans or have whatever uh, monitoring on a regular basis, but just that you should definitely advocate for yourself and decide on your interpretation of what you see in the information from, you know, Philadelphia, from Dr. Shields and what she recommends. Um, and then also what Baskin Palmer or really anybody else out there, like what's the monitoring schedule for a low risk tumor five years out yeah. and just determine for yourself, you know, what do I want this to look like? Um, so when you do have scans, it sounds like they've been fairly infrequent, but when you do, um, do you have any level of, I guess, kind of extra anxiety that comes up for you? And, and if so, how do you deal with uh, that? Well, I do have anxiety about it, which is probably why I've put it off. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very stressful thing when you've had uh, cancer in your body and no symptoms. You know, so I... I know that I should get the scans, but I, but like everybody else, the, um, the pandemic has put kind of a, kind a of pumped the brakes a little bit, sure. but I get eye scans, well, uh, mm -hmm. every four weeks because of the retinal issue. And yes. so the, um, my eye gets checked frequently. 
Always good. Definitely good to keep monitoring the eye. And of course, you mentioned that you had the different shots and things to help with preserving your vision. And I'm assuming probably keeping the pressure of the pain down. Um, so I think that's great. Yes. I had a so, crazy uh, experience where uh, not my regular doctor, one of the other ones, I was getting the ILEA shot and um, my I went blind right after it. At first it was cloudy. And then it looked like the solar system, and my eye pressure went up to eighty four. That's insane! My it was so. How did they fix they, that? Uh, needle extractions of the fluid. I guess it, there was just too much fluid, and like at least a dozen extractions, which were not fun. And um, but they were able to get it down. It's just um, I don't know if it was that error operator error or um just too much fluid but it was a very scary experience because when you lose your vision completely you don't know if you're going to get it back and it was a good 10 minutes that would be that would be terrifying it was terrifying um, especially for it to be something that they're like well we're gonna try to get it back but like we don't know I know it was it was um, definitely an emergency situation but um but you know you do anything that you can to preserve the vision that you've got. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm glad they were able to solve that and to fix that because that would, that would not have been fun. No, of course. The first um, thing I thought of was how am I going to tell my husband where, my, where the car is? And I have both oh. the keys. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, oh my the things that you think about so that you don't have to think mm -hmm. about, I don't have my vision. Yes, I know. It's crazy what we do. Our brains are really great at, evasive maneuvers. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, so as we kind of finish up this episode, can you just tell me what are, what are three things that you feel like you've learned in the last nearly seven years that you would pass on to any other patient in your shoes, whether they have a small melanoma, a large melanoma, young, old, like, you know, wherever they are on the spectrum, what would you pass on to someone else? Well, I think you have to be really persistent with everything with with your care, I would get another opinion, definitely. Um, and just be persistent with your care, like, and do, do what you think is right. Because, you know, people have some crazy ideas, some of the doctors. <laughs> and, um, yes, this is true. yes, so I think, um, you know, I've had a lot of lasers and uh, a lot of shots in the last couple of years. So it's kind of a day-to-day -day thing. So be persistent and then take it day by day. And what would be maybe the last thing you would pass on to someone else about just coping with this diagnosis? Well, my hobby I has always been needlepoint. And I got, it's very hard to do now. But I do it because I'm afraid one day I won't be able to do it. So um, I, during the pandemic, I made everyone in the family a uh, Christmas stocking. And, and, and everybody, I have to put it, put it down for a couple of days sometimes because it's so hard to do. But I'm kind of doing it more with, I have the one good eye and um, the feel. So I picked a... Um, it's been a lifelong ho hobby, really, but very difficult at this point. Yeah. So, uh, so be persistent in your care. And my goodness, I just blanked on the last one that you just said. A hobby, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. Pick a hobby. Like have have something that you lean into and that you focus yeah. on to kind of keep you keep you in line with with okay, I can I can still do this even though my eye is challenged or my vision is challenged or things have changed and I'm anxious about whatever. I still have this thing that I have been able to do, or I learned something new, like whatever it yes. is. Um, I think that's, that's very wise. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for your time and just sharing your story here. Thank you. It's really nice to talk to you. And it's nice to talk to people like you and Melanie and people that have been through it and can understand.
Well, we are definitely happy to chat anytime and please like we're, I mean, we're excited to continue, um, just working with you and talking with you and, and helping spread the word, um, through different news channels and as many social media places as we can. So we're just grateful for your willingness to be a part of this, this movement to get awareness for ocular melanoma out there. Um, and thank you again for, for being here thank today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today on the I Believe podcast, brought to you by Castle Biosciences. Please be sure to subscribe, and if you're so inclined, send this episode over to friends, family, and share on your social media to help spread awareness around OM. If you have a moment, leave us a brief review or consider making a donation to the links in the show notes to keep our podcast going. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Acure Insight. We'll see you next time on the I Believe podcast.